Now, all religious people, all religious people to one degree or another are participating in a process, a process, let's just call a process of negotiation with their sacred texts, with their Bibles, with their valuable literature. So you have a, I have a Bible, and I, the practicing, believing Christian, prayerfully consider the words therein, and I am constantly in a process of negotiation with the eternal, if you will, prayerfully considering the sacred text and deciding for myself which of these truths are deep, meaningful principles and ethics for the long term. Which of these are values are the rock that I can build my house upon? So the Bible tells you to dig deep. That means dig deep within your own heart, prayerfully consider. Dig deep within your, inside yourself and decide for yourself. Which of these are actually true and meaningful and everlasting truths that I can build my house on? The Bible says you build your house, you dig deep, build your house upon the rock. The floods come, the rains come, the house stands. Why? Because it's built upon rock. Also says, you are Peter, upon this rock I build my church. Gates of hell shall not prevail against it. All Christians, all religious people, truthfully, but all, I'm just concerning myself with Christians. All Christians to one degree or another are engaged in some form of process of this. If it is an honest, soul-searching, self-searching process, then you can dig deep within your own heart. The Bible says, I will be found of you if you search for me with all of your heart. And it starts to become really obvious. It starts to be illumine itself. Self-evident, if you will. Which of these truths are actually, say, are actually true, sacred, long-lasting principles, values, and ethics that I'm going to build my house on? And which are things to just, you know, that I'm, why is that in there? I'm not really sure. The underlying precept of apologetics, you've got to have a good answer for it. I'm not really sure that you do. Even the most literal literalist that ever tried to literalize the Bible has some things that they just sort of disregard. Do you really need to have a good justification for disregarding some of the contents? I'm not certain. Let's put it this way. Uh, there's, it wasn't really a big struggle to me when I saw the scripture that said stone homosexuals. I didn't have some big crisis. Oh, God's telling me to stone homosexuals. Didn't even think about it. And I don't know a single Christian this side of Matt Powell who did. Honestly, I don't know a single Christian this side of Matt Powell who had some sort of big struggle. Well, God's telling me to go stone homosexuals. Why is that? Do we actually need to have some logically thought out process of elimination? Why we, we need to, to, to not do that? No, not really. Never even occurred to me. And it never occurred to any Christian I've ever known outside of Matt Powell that that was God speaking. That that's what God was trying to speak through that, Christ, that particular scripture. That that's what we should do. Matter of fact, a lot of times when you're an actual practicing Christian and you're prayerfully considering the Bible, it becomes really obvious which of these things are life beneficial. Sacred truths, if you will. Things that we are not negotiating and which of them are just whatever. And one of the games we play, and we play it because atheists ask us to play it, is let's have a good justification for why I disregard it. I don't really need a good justification. Never occurred to me to have one. There was no cognitive dissonance involved in that. Never even thought about it as something that I should have followed. There's thousands of scriptures like that. I never even thought of a reason why I had to rationalize them. Why? Because I didn't honestly ever think that God was speaking to me through those scriptures. And nobody ever has. Outside of the lunatics. Yeah, the lunatic fringe. There's such a thing as a lunatic fringe in Christianity. That's for certain. But they don't dictate how the faith is actually practiced in the real world. And it never for a moment did it consider me outside of scam apologetic games that I have to actually justify why I don't regard those scriptures because it never occurred to me too. And it never occurred to any Christian I've ever known. Again, <laughs> with, the one with the one obvious, one obvious exception to the contrary. Now, one of the theories that goes on, it's a pretty, 
pretty interesting theory, I just don't think it's correct, is that, and this is the theory I borrowed from the atheists, I forget who I saw talking about this on Twitter, but I've seen it a few times, where they say what needs to happen in Islam. See, they're saying that that doesn't happen in Islam. Islam reads scriptures about, you know, murdering the infidels and tries to carry them out in the real world. Think that that's actually the, me the, the, the dictate of the sacred text. Sam Harris pretends that that's what we Christians do, but everybody knows that's not really what we Christians do. There's not a single church in this country outside of the Westboro Baptists that are taking the darker and more controversial scriptures and trying to walk out based on those. Nobody. Nobody. Outside of a few rare exceptions, and they, they fall under the category of the lunatic fringe. Really obviously so. Westboro Baptists and the person I keep mentioning. Maybe a couple others in there. I don't know. No, not Stephanie. <laughs> no, not Stephanie. Stephanie, yeah! No, not her. <laughs> not at all. The rest of us are actually walking out some form of Christianity that is reasonably sane, reasonably connected to the real world. Now, the theory of the atheists, and it's an interesting theory, I just don't think it's correct, is that Christianity went through a reformation, and that Islam needs to go through a reformation. That's why we know which scriptures to just kind of disregard. I don't really think that's true. I don't really think that's why it happened. I think it has a lot more to do with the sifting through the centuries. Kind of like the Bible has been peer-reviewed. And the churches that tried to build their houses on the rock. The churches that tried to build their houses on the sacred, non-negotiable, actual meaningful truths of the Bible. For example, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Don't find many people arguing with some of the scriptures in the Bible, even the atheists. Most of them recognize that there are really positive, good values in there. Especially in the teachings of Jesus Christ where it becomes really easily. But I don't find many churches actually try to build on the darker parts of the Bible. They try to build on the meaningful, real, true parts of the Bible. And if they did, guess what? They didn't pass the test of time. It was really that simple. Because the Reformation honestly doesn't really have that much to do with it. The Reformation was about other things. Honestly, the Reformation, I mean, just in brief, Martin Luther, one of the main complaints of Martin Luther, he came away with a, with a debatably one really good takeaway, you know, the justification by faith, which Romans does talk about, and he was really tr troubled by the selling of indulgences. And if you don't know the history, long and the short of it is, indulgence was some sort of elaborate Roman Catholic scam wherein the priest would sell you a place in heaven. Honestly, it was really that. It was really that. It was really that corrupt. You go to the priest and say, you know, I, I just did X. So I just, you know, I just, I just tried to, to rape this woman and I just beat up this guy. And he'd say, well, give me $600 and you'll be fine. And I'll, and I'll eliminate those sins from your repertoire. It was really some sort of scam like that. Honestly, that's exactly what it was. So that had more to do with the Reformation than anything else. It wasn't actually... Uh, you know, these are scriptures in the Bible that need the only time that's ever even occurred to anybody was when there were atheists in the room. Justify these particular scriptures. Other than that, it never occurred to most sane, reasonable Christians, hey, let's follow those scriptures as opposed to those ones. Why? Because there's a really obvious, illuminated path of life edifying value in the words of God. Honestly, in the Bible, there's a really obviously, and there's hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of the positive life edifying, you can build your house upon the rock scriptures. And everybody sort of knows this. And if you don't, go look at the Christian Twitter feeds. Because you'll learn it immediately. You'll learn it within one hour of reading the scriptures. You won't find any of the controversial ones, or very few. And you'll find only ones that even if you, an atheist, go, hmm, I can think about in a way that in a way that's more reasonable and ecumenical, and actually that's sound advice. You'll find that time and time again. Why? Because it's God's honest truth. It's God's honest truth. It's the actual approach to living a real faith. Real value, real life edifying words. My words are spirit and they are life. The only overarching metaphorical truth you need to concern yourself with is that the speaking of life builds life. And that's pretty obvious. That's something you can ask anybody who's faced real abuse in their life, if that's true. But 
anyways, that's all for now. I'll go into it again, I'm sure, in the future. Don't worry. I'll go into it in the future. Amen.